Luc Tarve is uh, the professor emeritus from Ghent in Belgium. And he is also a professor at the Tonji University. And in your uh, proceedings, you can find a relatively detailed uh, presentation of Luc. I will not take his time and repeat what is there, other than say, uh, best of luck, uh, Luc. I'm looking forward to your keynote presentation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, hello. Um, the title of my presentation is Two Words Resilient Concrete Structures in a Digitalized World. I will first start uh, by uh, telling you something about resilience, then about today's digitalized world. Next topic is Industry 4.0. And then we apply to the construction industry. Uh, section five deals with BIM, next 3D printing, and finally, I will present a conclusion. Let's first start with resilience. I have a definition here of resilience, which is the capacity of a system or society to resist and uh, recover from losses due to hazards or disasters. It comes from the Latin resilio, which means to jump back. And resilience can also be applied to ecological systems, social systems, human environment systems, and so on. And it can also uh, have a relation to long-term phenomena such as climate change, for instance. And of course, also resilience with respect to pandemics. It's a very actual, timely topic nowadays. Here you see a conceptual engineering approach to resilience, which is denoted here by R, resilience of structural systems. Along the vertical axis, you have a system state variable Q, describing the quality of a system in a general sense. And here you have the time axis. And at a certain moment in time, a shock occurs where you see that you have a loss in the quality. And then after this shock, this event occurs, you see that the quality gradually comes back to the original level again. And the dashed red line you see here is called the recovery path. Here are some more concepts indicated. Uh, the drop that you see here is also related to the vulnerability of the system. And the distance that is left here, the capacity or the quality that is left here is related to robustness. In fact, we can use four R's that are robustness, I just mentioned it. Rapidity, that's the speed at which the system recovers and comes back to the pre-shock quality. Then redundancy and resources. If redundancy increases, and also resources increase, that means the investments in the system, the vulnerability goes down and the rapidity of recovery increases. Vulnerability is the potential for loss and is related to structural sensitivity and also to the exposure the system has for instance, this makes a difference if, for instance, a structure is in a flooding prone area. Now, the shock can be termed as a structural accident like explosion, impact, a natural hazard, and so on, which results in partial or complete loss of functionality or availability, and also results in costs, economical, ecological, environmental, societal, and so on. 
Now something new I want to introduce, there's a concept beyond resilience and robustness, and that's anti-fragility. Well, most ways to make systems less fragile result in rigid, static, or vast structures, and in the limit, in the limit, these systems are not operational anymore. So anti-fragile systems just benefit from shocks, grow when exposed to volatility, to randomness, to disorder, and they like adventure, risk, uncertainty. So resilient systems resist shocks and stay the same after the recovery, but the anti-fragile systems get better. And nature has a tendency to create things that are anti-fragile. It appears that the natural evolution uses disorder to grow strong. Now, we could also imagine that digitalization is also like a shock that uh, where the construction industry is confronted with. So we can look to resilience of the construction industry and the concrete sector in particular with respect to digitalization. Is it a threat? Too many changes, perhaps, in a short time. It is an opportunity, probably, because it will result in a more efficient and smart way of building. Anyhow, we can say for sure that it is a challenge for the construction industry. Let's first have a look now to today's digitalized world. When you look to this uh, graph here, you see what is happening in a time span of only 60 seconds. Only 60 seconds. And what can you see, for instance, that uh, there are like more than 156 million emails sent worldwide. What can you see? There are more than 350,000 tweets every 60 seconds. There are more than 800,000 files uploaded on Dropbox. So all the figures you see, that's real a huge, a huge intensity of what is happening on the internet nowadays. And this very high speed also of communication has to do with the classical law of Morse that was defined in 1965 and is just an empirical statement, in fact, where he uh, said that the number of transistors on one chip doubles every two years. And this has been the case for many years, but nowadays we see that we come to a stagnation we come to a saturation because everything gets so miniaturized that we really approach the atomic level. The Internet of Things is the network of physical objects of or things that are embedded uh, with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the internet. And here you see really in a very impressive, a dramatic increase in the number of devices that is connected to the internet. IoT, some people also say the internet of threats because there is a huge security problem. Cybersecurity is a very hot topic there are hackers around the world, for instance, can even command a moving Jeep, could hack pacemakers, and so on. So in fact, the massive adoption of IoT by citizens relies on confidence in terms of security 
and privacy. Smart city. Smart city is a place where traditional networks and services are made more efficient with the use of digital and telecommunication technologies to support a city's resilience and sustainability. And this has uh, an impact on, for instance, air quality, energy, urban planning, green buildings, plant health, smart mobility, smart factories, smart farming, heat islands, infrastructure, and so on. Here uh, you have an overall picture of intelligent infrastructure. And in this graph, I have indicated the three basic aspects of sustainability, planet, people, profit, or environment, social aspects, economy. And you see again connected grids, connected cities, smart grids, connected vehicles, connected highways, connected factories traffic flow optimization, home energy management, and so on, and so on. So you see in these smart cities, we are all connected. A basic aspect in this uh, IoT is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, which is a very broad concept that encompasses computer programs that mimic computer programs that mimic human intelligence. But the basic form of artificial intelligence is rule-based and is dependent on programming. For instance, the computer program playing chess IBM's Deep Blue 1996 that went against Gary Kasparov. Smart speakers are wireless personal assistants based on voice recognition. Smart buildings are based on sensors and cameras. A subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning. In this case, machines take data and learn for themselves. They learn to recognize patterns as face recognition, object recognition, speech recognition. And the most advanced subset is so-called deep learning, which makes use of multi-layer artificial neural networks that stimulate or simulate better uh, human decision-making. This, these applications can turn out to be quite expensive and require huge data sets to train itself. Deep learning plays a crucial role in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, that's what is now happening. Machines start thinking, thinking. Machines start thinking and this can be really a threat for humans. Just an example here of damage localization and identification by means of deep learning. Here you see the results of a deep learning based structural damage detection method at the pixel level which makes use of a database of 2,750 images, including efflorescence, cracks, spalling, and surface holes. Here you see to the left an original image of efflorescence on a, on a concrete surface. Here you see the processed image. Similar for cracks, for surface holes and for spalling. Industry 4.0. Well, we have uh, had uh, industrial revolution, several industrial revolutions 
in the previous centuries already. The so-called first industrial revolution took place at the end of the 18th century, when mechanization, steam power, uh, weaving looms came into use. Next, at the end of the 19th century, we had uh, mass production, assembly lines, electrical energy applications. We term it as industry 2.0. More recently, we had industry 3.0 with automation, computers and electronics fully embedded in industry. And nowadays we speak about industry 4.0 where cyber physical systems, Internet of Things and networks are applied at full scale. These cyber physical systems are very uh, crucial in the whole industry 4.0. And uh, some examples are smart grids, autonomous automobile systems, medical monitoring, industrial control systems, robotic systems and automatic pilot in avionics. And here also uh, in other aspects are cloud computing, robotics, 5G, big data and analytics, additive manufacturing, and so on. And industry 4.0 results in the factory of the future the factory of the future 4.0. These are future oriented production plans implementing the concepts of the fourth industrial revolution. They deliver products with a high added value and they have the flexibility to respond to a quickly changing market demand. And for sure they will play a significant role in a dynamic and global production network. E-commerce or online shopping has become increasingly popular over the last decade. Here you see the uh, sales uh, of e-commerce, retail e-commerce sales in billion US dollars worldwide. And you see here now the, in 2020, we are at this level and you see the forecasts that's uh, ever, uh, that's again increasing, increasing again. In fact, we could say that an early example of uh, online shopping is ready mixed concrete. Now, industry 4.0, let's apply it to the construction industry. And I will first start by showing you some results of a McKinsey report, the next normal in construction. The next normal, so that is what we may expect. And the subtitle is how disruption is reshaping the world's largest ecosystem. The world's largest ecosystem is the construction industry which uh, is uh, related to 13% of the world's GDP. So this will uh, be the next normal and the transformation will take time, certainly will take time, but the COVID-19 crisis will accelerate the change. Some quotes from this report. Historically, the construction industry has underperformed. Low productivity growth, less than 1% per year for the industry over the past 20 years, versus 2.8% for the total economy. Low customer satisfaction and regular time and budget overruns. A 2016 analysis found that construction projects typically take 20% longer to finish than scheduled and are up to 80% over budget, frequently resulting in litigation. And that often 
leaves customers dissatisfied, resulting in complex and time-consuming claims processes. This is a basic summarizing table in this report where you have a list of changes in market characteristics. There is a list of emerging disruptions and there is also a list of nine shifts which will fundamentally change the construction industry. I will limit myself in discussing these emerging disruptions. The first one is industrialization. Industrialization where production systems use increasingly modular components, use automated manufacturing, robotics supported on-site execution and digital planning and production, all these elements increasing the productivity. And we can say that a perfect example of this industrialization is the precast concrete industry. Next emerging disruption are new materials, new material technologies new lighter weight materials enabling improved logistics. And uh, in fact, the concrete industry recently moved to self-compacting concrete, to ultra high performance concrete, to fiber reinforced concrete. And on this picture here, you see the use of self-compacting concrete in a precast concrete factory. Here, when you speak about self-compacting concrete, you see the building, new building of the Port Authority office in Antwerp, Belgium, designed by Zaha Hadid. And the new, sorry, the new structure, the outside columns, but also the internal part are all in white self-compacting concrete. Here's some inside pictures. Ultra high performance concrete, which is obtained by an optimized packing and grading of small particles, reaches uh, very high compressive strengths over 150 megapascal. Here you see some early applications, a footbridge, pedestrian bridge in uh, Korea, and the uh, Mio Viaduct toll gate in France. Some more recent applications is a pedestrian bridge near Brussels in uh, UHPC, or the first railway bridge in Germany, Germany in UHPC also. And of course, the well-known Musem in Marseille, a filigree UHPC structure. And of course, in UHPC, we can make also more relaxing objects. The next uh, disruption is digitalization of the products and of the processes. I will talk about this in a separate section. And finally, here are indicated some new entrants this is a new breed of players disrupting current business models, so-called startups or also so-called insurgent players. Insurgents are strong on innovation and iteration. They have no brand and no customers, and they need to steal customers from the incumbents. And the incumbents, the, the classical players, have strong brands and relationships with existing customers. They need to learn to innovate and iterate. Drones are also important in actual construction industry. Drones can, for instance, be used for scanning, scanning of buildings, scanning of bridges. And uh, the pictures that are taken, they can also use different types of cameras, for instance, infrared cameras, and the obtained data are processed. And the processed data can be used for visualization 
quality control, fabrication, but also inspection. Drone inspection of bridges and buildings is uh, very important in damage diagnosis. Virtual reality is a computer generated environment that to the person experiencing it closely resembles reality. VR headsets transport users into a fully interactive 3D environment, giving them the opportunity to explore virtual representation of a particular room, a floor, or a building design as a whole. A greater degree of interaction can take place during the conceptual phases between the designer and the user. And by being able to walk through virtual spaces, layout conflicts should be more easily identifiable so that they can be adjusted earlier. Augmented reality is an interactive experience of a real world environment where the objects that reside in the real world are enhanced by computer generated perceptual information. This includes virtual elements that interact with what already exists at different layers. 3D BIM models and virtual model holograms can be viewed before and during the building process, creating an understanding of planning, avoiding errors and reducing construction costs. Augmented reality facilitates the execution of complex projects that require a series of measurements, verification and specific care through digital instructions that are virtually superimposed on the workspace, directing a step-by-step -step guide for the construction process. In the framework of Industry 4.0, let me mention the Belgium joint, Belgium China Joint Laboratory for Industrial Industrialized Construction, which was established in 2017. And it is a joint effort between the Manuel van der Pitte Lab of the Ghent University, Tongji University, and Shanghai Construction Group. And let me just mention that in this, this way, I got partly involved in the Hong Kong Zuhai Macau link opened in 2018. This is the 55 kilometer bridge tunnel system consisting of a series of three cable state bridges, an undersea tunnel and four artificial islands. It is both the longest sea crossing and the longest open sea fixed link in the world crossing the Pearl River Delta. The tunnel, the immerse tunnel has a length of more than 5,600 meter. It consists of 33 elements, which are subdivided in smaller segments. Here you see a cross section of the tunnel. We had the opportunity to cooperate on the assessment of the mechanical behavior of immersion joints and a seismic mitigation method concerning these tunnel elements. This resulted in a PhD thesis where tests were performed at Tongji University uh, tunnel segments at the scale of 110, and these were loaded in a bidirectional reaction frame in the state key lab of disaster reduction and civil engineering at Tongji University. Another project related to tunneling is the quasi-rectangular shield tunnel concept that uh, is applied, for instance, in a tunnel, tunnel in uh, Ningbo. The concept is, is the very specific quasi-rectangular cross-sectional shape. Uh, this uh, is compared here to two tubes, two parallel single-track tubes. 
And the advantage of this uh, concept is that the total width is uh, much smaller than a classical two tube concept, resulting in less excavation, less influence on the built environment. Of course, the geometry is more complex. The segments are more complex. Also, the internal forces are more complex than in just a circular cross section. And the aim of this uh, PhD thesis related to it is to develop a reliable design model. The next topic I will discuss is BIM. The origins of BIM go back to 1975, where building descriptive system was proposed by Charles Eastman, consisting of models instead of drawings, and the database-oriented approach was introduced for visual and quantitative analysis. In the 80s, R&D track and ongoing discussions resulted in building product models, production information models, models so-called PIM, the main goal not being to develop software, but rather data handling and changing the way in which architecture, engineering, and construction, abbreviated as AEC, AEC industry professionals work. And in the 90s, the term building environment, uh, sorry, information model is coined. BIM is a virtual model of the building that is made up of dynamic and intelligent virtual building components that contain information about their identity and geometry. And the information stored in the BIM model can be extracted from it in various ways, in the form of plans, sections, 3D views, a bill of quantities, estimates, space layout, solar studies, etc. So the BIM model therefore has both a geometric aspect and a data aspect. So BIM is the process by which building information is created, exchanged and used to plan ahead. And by many people, BIM is considered as the catalyst for innovation in the AEC industry. Well, this uh, introduction of BIM is termed by Sylvia Ceres as a Gutenberg moment. Sylvia Ceres is an investor and developer of technologies and companies. And she uses the term Gutenberg moment. Uh, she refers to the Gutenberg, the German inventor of printing press, at least in the Western world. And this initiated a mass communication by printed books, which was not possible before. And this huge uh, start of mass communication, well, the topics you see here are, can also be considered as Gutenberg moments, and BIM is one of the so-called Gutenberg moments. When we look to the left here to the modeling that is used classically between architects, project planners, clients, facility management, and so on, you see that different models are located in private work spaces and that you have a very complex exchange of data and information. When we look to the BIM model, that's a data-centric model as shown here data centric model but of course each of the partners can have its own workbench and its own client software iso there are some iso related standards on bim you see here some titles dealing with different aspects of bim each BIM can be applied to the complete life cycle, as you see here, starting from the very beginning conceptual design over detailed design, fabrication, construction, operation and maintenance, demolition or renovation. 
and we can use the same basic model in all these stages. So this means that there will be also financial incentives to use BIM because it can reduce failure costs. It will arrange efficiency in gains. We can optimize the life cycle cost. And in this way, we can in general increase the sustainability of a project. Some new opportunities for BIM processes and approaches in structural engineering are information exchanges between uh, BIM or information exchanges between BIM and finite element models by means of open formats. Integration of BIM and uh, Internet of Things to manage monitoring data and enable a better management of structural engineering data in the operating phase. Integration of BIM and city information modeling to support large scale analysis on the built environment. 3D printing. 3D printing now has become, let's say, common practice in many places around the world, although mainly limited to demonstration projects. Advantages are that we don't need form work anymore and that we are no, not limited to fixed shapes. Of course, there are some challenging still to be solved. Because of the layered structure, what about the mechanical properties? How to introduce reinforcement in a proper way? Applications here, you see the first 3D printed house in Belgium. And to the right, you see a pedestrian bridge in Shanghai a tree printed bridge. Structural form finding or topology optimization can also be linked through to 3D printing. Topology optimization is a computational methodology for optimizing the distribution of material in a given design domain. So in a given volume, as you can see here, for instance. Mostly it is used to reduce weight and increase stiffness, for instance, as originally applied in the automotive and aerospace industries. And the shape of the cross section can be adopted to a so-called optimal flow of forces. So left you see, to the left you see the starting design domain. To the right we have a classical strut and tie model. Here below you have the optimized truss model. And to the right you have the optimized continuum model. Of course, with the classical ways of construction, it is not possible to realize this in practice. An application of the principle, the same principle can be, fine, can be found in the CITIC financial center in Shenzhen, where you see this typical diagrid structure, which is used to transfer of gravity and lateral loads by inclined columns. The optimization starts from the optimal position of one of the basic nodes. Then the number of braces is increased and a stretching is applied. And finally, we result in this very aesthetic concept. Let me give you an example of the merging of two technologies. This, what you see here, is a 3D printed post tensioned concrete girder bridge designed by topology optimization. And the result you see here was developed at the Mengel van der Pitte lab in Ghent University. 
the optimization was uh, guided by minimizing the displacement at the top surface of the beam. And for this purpose, this objective functional was minimized sub, uh, and uh, taking into account the various restraints that you see here. Then to make the bridge as such, the bridge was subdivided in different parts and uh, sliced as you see here. And these are the separate parts that afterwards are connected by the post-tensioning strands and some uh, rebars. Future evolution is 4D printing. That is printing with smart materials that can respond to external stimuli. And this permits the creation of on-demand, dynamically controllable shapes by integrating the dimension of time. Ladies and gentlemen, my conclusion can be very short. And I just quote Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one most adaptive to change. Thank you for your attention. Xie Xie.